It worked. <laughs> the photograph on the screen <clears throat> may look familiar to you. If so, it isn't what you think it is. It's not by Peter Moore, and it does not depict a decisive moment from Robert Rauschenberg's dance work, Pelican, which is, this is the photograph by Peter, shot in 1965 in performance. This first one was created in 1999 by an artist named Jeff Feld. Its full title is <clears throat> Performance of the Only Part of Robert Rauschenberg's Pelican That I Know black and white photograph of the artist during performance, Burlington Memorial Auditorium, Burlington, Vermont, 8-21-99. As Jeff told me, referring to Peter's image, that image became a stand-in or substitute for all the other information that was lacking. And a lot is lacking. Although I love Jeff's photo on its own terms, it demonstrates how a handful of iconic images have taken possession of the history of performance art. Unlike the original dance, which had two other performers and several complex maneuvers, and here that's Alex Hay, uh, Carolyn Brown on point, and uh, Rauschenberg, uh, Jeff's performance consisted solely of skating in a circle with three cameras trained on him, quote, taking pictures of me as I passed a specific point where I hit the pose. When it was all said and done, I had numerous images to choose from, and I was quite lucky to have gotten that one, unquote. It was a single constructed event calculated towards the camera, a reflection of the mutating role of the photographer in relation to performance art. That role is a digression that won't be addressed here. What I want to emphasize is that just as Jeff's photo performance appropriates the reductive version of Pelican, Pelican itself and other unquestionable masterpieces such as Yvonne Rayner's Trio A are the reductive version of a very eclectic scene. As Carolyn Brown once said in a totally different historical context, I remember it as messier than that. I'm going to present Judson as a lot messier. Car Sally Baines, in her invaluable book, Democracy's Body, Judson Dance Theater, 1962 to 1964, to which I'm hugely indebted, talks of the fragmentary nature of the history of performance. I want to present additional fragments, not necessarily as an alternative history, but as a more nuanced version of the popular narrative. This selection of images is made from a limited number of years in only one photographer's archive, the tens of thousands of negatives and transparencies shot by Peter Moore from 1962 to 1993. There's lots more work still to be done in exploring that voluminous archive as well as those of late, other late 20th century performance photographers. Robert McElroy, Scott Hyde, Babette Mangot, Nat Tileston, Bob Alexander, Harry Schunken, John Kender, Paula Court, Donna Ann McAdams, and Fred McDara are only a few. Baines covers the 16 Concerts of Dance, and that's Concerts with Cap C and Dance with a Cap D and four single choreographer evenings that sprang directly from the weekly dance workshop here at the church. I've allowed myself looser parameters, including several digressions to other venues as a way of adding context and continuity to some of the work, people, and ideas. Baines speaks of three basic styles coming out of the workshop. First, the analytic reductive wing of the postmodern dance movement for which she lists Yvonne Rayner, Lucinda Childs, Steve Paxton, and Robert Mars, and Tricia Brown. Two, the theatrical, often, hum often humorous, Baroque style of David Gordon, Fred Herko, and Arlene Rothlein. Three, multimedia works such as that of Elaine Summers and Judith Dunn. I'm going to emphasize several sub-themes an eclecticism fostered by the environment of the church, an emerging intermedia or hybrid form between media rather than combining media, something that anticipates performance art, a new approach to the object, an innovative use of materials, and interdisciplinary collaboration. Pictured is the door to this room as it appeared in 1963 with a word summing up the significance of this secret and wondrous space. 
To understand Judson as a sanctuary for the arts, one has to imagine an almost inconceivable time before government funding. There were no alternative spaces. A handful of theaters, the Master Institute on 103rd Street, Cooper Union's Great Hall, the 92nd Street Y, Hunter College, Henry Street Settlement, could be rented or used by invitation, which made them only rarely accessible to impecunious young performers with daring new work. As Yvonne Rayner has said, quote, the church seemed a positive alternative to the once a year hire a hall mode of operating that had plagued the struggling modern dancer before. Here we could present things more frequently, more informally, and more cheaply, and most important of all, more, co more cooperatively, unquote. Judson had had other program, arts programs. There was already a theater program in the late 1950s. The great gospel singer Mahalia Jackson gave a concert here in 1957. Assistant Minister Bud Scott published three issues of a beat-oriented magazine called Exodus. And in the early 1960s, the Judson Gallery hosted seminal installations, happenings, and assemblages by Klaus Oldenburg, Jim Dine, Ellen Capro, Robert Whitman, Al Hansen, and others. Judson's openness to the arts meant sanctuary of all kinds. After Shirley Clark's film of the Living Theater's production of The Connection was banned in 1962, it was screened right here in front of the altar, exactly as you're looking at this now, but with a much larger screen up higher. <laughs> um, and Lenny Bruce's memorial took place here in 1966. In May 1962, about a month prior to the first official concert of dance, there was a dance performance created by Peter Schumann, a German sculptor who had come to the United States in 1961 and who later formed the Bread and Puppet Theater. Schumann had experimented with dance in Germany and attended some of the Judson workshop sessions, but rejected the, analy the analytical approach he found there in favor of something more visceral. Totentanz, or death dance, was crude, dramatic, and powerful in the German expressionist tradition. The performers were the alchemy players, a group of Richard Tyler's friends who used to jam together. Dick Tyler was a very intense printer and book artist who used to sell his pamphlets from Pushcart in the Village and who died in 1983. Anyway, the alchemy players weren't real musicians any more than they were real dancers. The performance centered around, centered around the figure of death <coughs> played by Tyler. All seven performers wore Schumann's papier-mâché masks and doubled as sound makers and dancers. The combination of human and puppet elements, as well as the ritualistic form and steady percussive rhythm, have continued in Schumann's theater. When the workshop-sponsored concerts began in summer 1962, they fostered diversity and a cooperative, often collaborative, interaction between dance and the disciplines of music and visual art. A major example of this spirit of inquiry and collaborative interchange was a concert of dance number 13 in November 1963. Titled Col A Collaborative Event, it was a virtually seamless series of individual works by different choreographers working in different styles, tied together solely by their varied uses of a sculptural environment by artist Charles Ross, and here this is Ross building part of that environment, which was happening during the performance. Ross's environment, an example of what nowadays would be called installation art, consisted of a freestanding trapezoidal tubular metal pipe sculpture and a conglomeration of lumber, scaffolding, and a seesaw that served as focus and inspiration for each individual choreographer's vision. On the other side of the room, in other words, in back of us, on uh, near the balcony, Ross and an assistant constructed a towering chair sculpture, what you're seeing here, that evolved continuously and simultaneously with other works being performed throughout the second half of the program. 
Peter shot an astonishing 20 rolls of film on the single evening we attended. Many of the images on large two and a quarter by three and a quarter film, which is 120 film, using an extremely wide angle lens, and you'll see a couple of those in the pictures I'm gonna show. The first piece on the program, and this is an overview that maybe gives you the orientation there. There's the pipe sculpture, and we're facing the altar, of course. The first piece on the program was Qui a mangé le baboon by Ross, in which he and Susan Kaufman sent a large black balloon aloft where it floated over and was kept in motion by the audience. During this slow, gentle game, the rest of the performers came out and set up the space, which led to a free play section in which everybody participate, and which is also pictured here. Next was Ruth Emerson's Sense, a flowing gymnastic piece in which Emerson gracefully swung, slid, and swooped, traversing the entire trapezoidal structure without touching the ground. Next was Carolee Schneemann's lateral splay, which functioned as a sort of entre-act, repeated two or three times between other pieces during the evening. Lateral splay was a sudden eruption of hurtling energy lasting only a few minutes that consisted of many forms of running, upright, backwards, crouched down, any way anybody could do it, basically. The dancers ran at full force throughout the entire space, including the balcony with instructions not to stop until colliding with an obstacle, human or otherwise. In Alex Hay's prairie, Hay tied himself to three pillows and kept repositioning himself along the bars, trying to keep the pillows under him. An audio tape of his own voice kept asking, are you comfortable? And making comments such as that he didn't look comfortable, to which his live voice would reply one way or the other, either yes, I'm comfortable, or whatever he was feeling at the time. And this was a fairly brief piece of about five minutes. And here's several other uh, configurations he took during that. Next was Carla Blank's turnover, in which all the female dancers turned the pipe sculpture over and over. The trapezoid was very tall and heavy, but there was also a somewhat scary momentum in which as it tilted up, the women on one side would rise from it and be, rise with it and be hanging from the top. In her book, Feelings Are Facts, Yvonne describes the exhilaration they felt. I found it breathtaking to engage in this heavy and slightly dangerous work with a team of women. Next was a collaboration between Ross and Rayner called Room Service. While Ross and two helpers continually rearranged the structures and props, three follow the leader teams of three performers each went over, under, around, and through them. And that's Carla Blank, Sally Gross, and Yvonne in that sequence. After room service, the sanctuary was a mess filled with upended sculptures, furniture, lumber, and assorted junk. Composer Philip Corner utilized this to make intermission itself a piece in which the room was cleared and Ross's sculptures reassembled in a purposeful way while contact mics relayed the action sounds to the audience in the lobby. Then came Deborah Hay's Would They or Wouldn't They, danced by Hay, Alex Hay, Rayner and David Lee with music by Al Hansen. This was a rather enigmatic dance whose ambiguities are reflected in the title. The two men and two women performed separate actions with the women periodically calling out for the men to carry or lift them. They all ended up hanging from the trapezoid. Yvonne Rayner's shorter end of a small piece was a fragment rather than a finished work. Uh, there's little information on this piece any place, even from Yvonne, and some elements of the, uh, we know ended up in a later work. I happen to like this picture, which is the main reason I put it in here. Um, Joan Baker's ritual uh, had, <clears throat> had a group of 
People in a uh, one figure would separate from the group, climb to the pinnacle of the trapezoid, fall down, scattering the group, and then the whole thing would repeat with a different, uh, a so sacrificial somewhat appearing figure. And it seemed to have religious implications because the for performers wore yarmulkes, which uh, with an odd touch of humor were tie-dyed, very 60s. <gasps> Last on the program was Lucinda Child's egg deal. A large part of the dance was manipulating egg cartons in prescribed ways, tossing, stacking, tying with string, kicking, etc. And it was Child's first choreographed piece for a group. And this is an overall view of that, which is this wonderful overview of the church uh, with that wide angle lens. And you can see the atmosphere really wonderfully how that was. <clears throat> One of the spirits who hovers over the early Judson is James Waring. Jimmy was not a participant in the workshop, and as a result, even though he gave several concerts at Judson, he's not technically considered part of that group. His work was by turns fay, campy, arch, obsessed with costumes and props, eccentric, elegant, and graceful. He referred to his dances as ballets. He was outrageously witty and seemed to have his finger on the pulse of the times, feeding into and, de and deriving inspiration from an incredibly diverse range of aesthetic situations. Classical ballet, modern dance, happenings, pop art, and the poetic haiku-like conceptual events initiated by Fluxus artists such as George Brecht. Here he is in two solos wearing beautiful costumes that he designed and made himself. This is tambourine dance in 1965, and this is March in 1966. To give you an idea of how Judson's eclectic arts policy could enrich its audiences, these two works I've just shown by Jimmy once appeared together on a church benefit program along with Yvonne Rayner's postmodern masterwork, The Mind is a Muscle. Bits and pieces of Jimmy's choreography remain in repertory or get revived periodically. But the outrageous, goofy, happenings-like pieces that I love the most are not the ones you're ever going to see recreated. I once queried David Vaughn, the most knowledgeable person on Jimmy's oeuvre, about such a possibility, and he just laughed. Perhaps you can understand their elusive complexity from the following photos of At the Hallelujah Gardens in 1963, which took place at Hunter College. Jimmy's company at this time included Valda Setterfield, Fred Herko, David Gordon, Yvonne Rayner, Eileen Pasloff, Deborah Hay, Elizabeth Keene, Barbara Dilley, and Arlene Rothline, among others, a pantheon of remarkable individualists. It was meant as the fondest compliment when Yvonne, in discussing the unconventional movements in her own early dances and how they were intended to shatter the suffocating, quote, conventions and standards of beauty and grace, unquote, paid homage to Jimmy by noting that to become a member of Merce Cunningham's company required a certain physical, quote, maneuverability, unlike Jimmy, she said, who took a lot of misfits, unquote. Or as Val Valda Setterfield has said, one got to be able to do all sorts of things one might earlier, earlier have thought were, not, were just not suitable, not proper, not appropriate." Unquote. It's impossible to sort out who contributed what props and incidents to Hallelujah Gardens. Uh, we do know that this costume Yvonne is wearing is a painted cardboard box painted by Al Hansen. Um, there were objects by pop, happenings, and fluxus artists coming out of nowhere, as indicated by the extensive program credits. They read as follows. Scenery, objects, and events by Al Hansen, other events by George Brecht, costumes by George Brecht, Red Grooms, Al Hansen, Robert Indiana, Larry Poons, Lucas Samaras, Robert Watts, Robert Whitman, George Breck's costume for Mr. Waring is part 27 of the Yam Festival. 
And the Yen Festival was a Fluxus uh, type uh, series of events in May of 1963. And it had, there were other ramifications earlier even, I won't get into, but. Anyway, uh, this is Yvonne on the left and Valda, and uh, I, I believe Yvonne is unwinding this ribbon from Valda's costume. <laughs> And in this uh, photograph, everybody's blowing those party whistles that incur with a feather at the end. To top it all off, <clears throat> the music, a tape collage, was by Richard Maxfield, the company's music director and one of the most innovative and influential audio tape composers America has produced. Waring's antic use of props is consistent with art's renewed fascination with the object in the early 1960s. After the overwhelming dominance of abstraction in the 1950s and the particularly intense, often grandiose manifestations of abstract expressionism, the object had a resurgent, not, surgeons, resurgence, not just in pop art, but in assemblage and the small gestural performances and artworks of Fluxus. These tended towards concretism, that is, the object as itself, neither depicted nor recreated nor romanticized. Throughout the 1960s, Jimmy did occasional improvised lecture demonstrations, often in collaboration with the composer and Judson performer, John Herbert McDowell, in which they skewered the functions of an assortment of mundane and exotic objects. Here, uh, here's Jimmy at the Cafe El Gogo in 1964. Uh, this is at the Bridge Theater with John Herbert in spring of 65. And this is at the annual New York Avant-Garde Festival, uh, that was Charlotte Mormon's uh, festival later that same year. So you can see how these people got around and, and interacted with each other. The only piece he had on an official concert of dance program was in concert number 12, which took place at the Tiny Gramercy Arts Theater in August 1963. Imperceptible elongation number one was a flash of a piece that opened the program. With precision timing, hands of invisible performers burst through a large paper screen showering confetti as large white paper balls sailed over the audience from the balcony. In addition to his use of objects and costumes, Jimmy made fascinating use of gestures. Uh, here are the performers in Hallelujah Gardens reeling at the world sort of with clenched fists as they advance forward. And this is Yvonne grimacing in Jimmy's piece Dromenon. And she Actually, she has some pieces where she seems to have used that gesture before this piece, so there's probably a little back and forth there. He also brought great inventiveness to his direction of short theater works by poets. Here he is with Deborah Hay, and Deborah's on the right in the white costume, uh, in his production of Diane de Prima's Poets Vaudeville at Judson, 1963. And this shows the scene behind us in those days, which lasted for years with that very unphotogenic curtain that was always there, and thank goodness is gone. Um, and of course, Jimmy would have made these costumes also. Another choreographer with an eclectic sensibility who used humor, lots of object props and costumes is David Gordon, whom you're more likely to know as the polymathic creator, writer, choreographer, theater director, and performer that he has become. David's humor in this period was more pointed than Jimmy's. His Random Breakfast, 1963, which he called a quote, lavish spectacle that included at least a dozen costume changes, innumerable accessories, props, sound cues, and complicated timing, unquote, and all of that was accomplished in 30 minutes. Satirizing, among other things, the very processes of making dance that the Judson members themselves exp experimented with. It was in six sections, starting with an elaborate and hilarious strip by Valda that David said made her look like Queen Mary taking off her clothes in public. Here's a few more of these costume changes that he had. 
uh, in this piece. This is the Lemon Hearts dance from Random Breakfast in Spanish costume. Uh, Big Girls Don't Cry had Valda as a nun. And the last part was uh, David in Top Hat and Tails while Judy Garland was singing Over the Rainbow. Robert Morris called David's work, quote, expressionism which lies beyond official dance technique, unquote. Jill Johnston referred to David and Valda as, quote, two Art Nouveau comedians, unquote, who have been the unwitting commentators on the scene they helped create. Here's Valda in David's Fragments, also known as Silver Pieces in 1964. This was a work, uh, it actually was a suite of seem seemingly unrelated pieces that uh, was performed in front of a tuned TV set whose sound and images created unexpected juxtapositions. And of course, actually, I'm still selecting from a lot of these other scenes that I'm describing that there are photographs of and it's just, you know, it's never complete. While we're on the subject of humor, there's John Herbert McDowell, a composer whose presence once more attests to the cross-fertilization between disciplines that characterize Judson. In Auguries, 1963, the finale had him on a platform, seemingly unable to control his hands, which had a zany life of their own, wildly slithering off the side of the platform, disappearing into his sweatshirt pockets, all sorts of what he said were funny things to do with hands. As hilarious and perfectly timed as his execution of these rapid gestures was, his performance style treated them as natural everyday occurrences, or as Johnston put it, quote, having no ties or tensions arising from a training and having an inordinate sense of fun, unquote. Eight pas de deux, pas de trois, and finale in 1963 was subtitled A Small Token for James Waring's Hallelujah Gardens, that piece you just saw before, so you can imagine how crazy it was. Johnston called it a silly spectacle with a lot of crazy ladies, and, but also said it was a soothing hypodermic in serious times. There was a huge cast and the music was a tape collage of waltzes by over 40 composers. Each ensemble was funnier than the last and it all came to a tremendous climax. Here's John Herbert's pas de deux with Tricia Brown. In Sally Baines's analysis, humor was associated with the more flamboyantly theatrical choreographers. One exception to this categorization is Alex Hay, a pop-oriented painter and sculptor who, like many other Judson participants, had not previously created performances. Alex's work was both humorous and conceptually minimalist. Lacking the Olsen and Johnson hells a pop and abandon of Waring's and McDowell's works, Alex's might be regarded as a cross between the early task pieces and conceptually fueled dance constructions of Simone Forti and the fluxus dialectics of George Machunas. That's my linkage. I don't think Alex would appreciate being compared in that way to George. In each of them, Alex set up a situation and then with great precision followed it to its logical but extreme conclusion. These single idea pieces were hilarious in their simplicity and Alex's dogged determination to see them to the end. You've already seen Prairie, the piece with the pillows, in its first incarnation as part of a collaborative event at Judson. This piece could be adapted to different site-specific situations. This is with a ladder in a small Upper East Side proscenium theater in 1964. This is in the vast ceiling grid of a television studio on the Upper West Side in 1965, and there was a whole series of Judson um, performers and happenings uh, in this studio. Uh, here's Alex in this grid that's way up in the ceiling, just like that. It's pretty, pretty high up. 
Colorado Plateau that is shown here as performed in a Judson offshoot series, and there were quite a few of these uh, in those years. This one was called Surplus in 1964. Numbered wood paddles were attached to each of the inanimate mannequin-like dancers. The soundtrack instructed Hay to carry so-and-so from one specific location to another on the stage and so on. And here's Alex carrying uh, Robert Rauschenberg in that manner. In Leadville, here in 1965, as part of the New York Theater Rally, and that was the series that was in that TV studio I mentioned, Hay, wearing a silver jumpsuit and carrying a reel-to-reel -reel tape deck on his back, slowly descended a pole. As he traversed the huge space, I remember it as a lumbering, swaying walk, perhaps in time to whatever audio was coming out of the tape deck. Spent tape spilled out of the machine, leaving a trail behind him. Topsoil, in spring 1966, was part of the Now Festival in a roller skating rink in Washington, D.C. Hay always wore weird but somehow appropriate costumes, in this case a suit rimmed with metal rings. The vast floor of the skating rink was covered with panels of paper. One by one, Hay hooked a cord at the end of each panel to his costume, so that as he walked, he pulled up the paper behind him. The floor was very large, and I remember this piece as being very long and the audience as being very restive. I myself had gotten used to performances that capitalized on the state Nam June Paik referred to as beyond boredom, and I loved the monotony and repetition that were so focused on bringing a single monumental task to completion. And this is the overall view there, so you can see how big it is. The climax of Hay's career and what I believe was his last performance piece occurred later that year in October 1966. It was Grassfield, part of Nine Evenings Theater and Engineering at the 69th Regiment Armory over on 26th Street. Hay sat in the middle of a field of numbered canvas squares with a huge TV image of his face behind him. And to put this in context, the Porta Pack first became available only a year earlier in October 1965. So this is an extremely early example of artists' video, as well as being um, a dance performance. This was accompanied by a live soundtrack of his amplified heartbeat. The action consisted of Robert Rauschenberg and Steve Paxton carrying long poles, to which they scooped up the panels in numerical order, depositing them in a pile at the side. Eddie Barton only created one work in two variants for the workshop, but it was a small gem on the cusp of performance art. Pop number no. one, 1963, once again held up an object to ridiculous examination. Barton came out on stage, laid out a map, blew up a balloon and set it on the mat, imitated a gesture of checking the wind with his finger, then suddenly flipped backwards, breaking the balloon with a resounding pop. This gesture was so deft and unexpected that it had the audience in stitches. At the next concert, the program listed pop number two. Barton appeared on stage and made the same exact preparations, but playing with the audience's expectations that he would repeat his stunt in the same way, landed intentionally off the mat quickly flipping a second time to make the perfect pop. Speaking of humor, I have to mention Katie Litz, but I only wish I had more to show, and uh, this is a, a very influential performer with, with some of the Judson people, uh, and I'm sure there's a greater amount of material that deserves attention, um, not, and Peter doesn't have a huge amount on her. Um, here she is in What's the Big Idea, 321, which was 1966, so I think it's an earlier piece. And uh, this is a piece called Continuum in 1964. 
and her costumes here were by Rainy Charlotte. In an atmosphere that valued process over technique, many early works used game-like rules as structure and had a playful atmosphere. There is so much material to cover, and I'm only going to go through a few of these um, very briefly. Uh, this is Trisha Brown's Rule Game 5 in 1966, in which the performers ran back and forth in lanes, uh, but had to adjust their height, upright, squatting, or crawling in certain ways in order to pass each other. And uh, the person whose back is to us in the front, that's Walter de Maria. Uh, so there's another, um, you know, instance where there, there's a number of visual artists who performed in this piece and with Trisha. Uh, as more of this cross-disciplinary interaction. This is Deborah Hayes' serious duet uh, in which the performers are Robert Rauschenberg and Alex Hay. Uh, the action doesn't look serious despite the title, but then again, the performers aren't smiling in any of the pictures Peter took. Uh, and I guess they just took their game playing very seriously. I'm reminded of Lamont Young's statement printed on the programs for some earlier performances that he had organized. Uh, and the statement was, the purpose of this series is not entertainment. One of the most spare, minimalist, and haunting works produced by the workshop was Arizona, 1963, by sculptor Robert Morris. The most dramatic moment came when, using an image from sports, Morris threw a javelin with a one sudden gesture. From the beginning, the Judson dancers had some notoriety and were invited to perform in different locations, Washington, D.C., Woodstock, Ann Arbor, Michigan, etc. And usually these were in an art context. One of the strangest environments they encountered was Kutcher's Country Club, a Catskills Borscht Belt Resort where some members of the group performed in August 1965. Performances took place both indoors on a stage that I remember as the nightclub and in one section of the large verdant expanse outdoors. Uh, this may even have been part of the golf course, I'm not sure. A golf cart driven by Steve Paxton and Deborah Hay surreptitiously inching along under a blanket of fake grass, blending in so well that at first it took a while to realize she was there. Paxton's piece, Deposit, had him and Hay batting around one of his chair-shaped inflatables. And this is part of the audience. As you can surmise from the previous images, and probably already know anyway, one of the people who brought a particularly original approach to the object prop and experimented most successfully with new materials was Steve Paxton. Steve was a great innovator in other ways, of course, the most well-known being contact improvisation, but I'm going to focus on a narrow selection of early work. This is Rialto. Uh, this was done over at the uh, Pocket Theater, a little theater on um, uh, 3rd Avenue, south of 14th Street. Uh, it's from 1964. Um, he snapped pictures of the audience, disappeared into a stack of cardboard boxes, uh, manipulated them somewhat, and then came out and snapped more pictures. He created a whole series of works using inflated, transparent plastic, sometimes in the pop art shape of a chair, as in the performance at Kuchers, and here as in section of a new unfinished work, 1965, augmented 1966 in 1966, and in front of that same Judson curtain. And actually, you know, there was something parallel going on in the culture at the time um, when I see this chair, because there was a lot of inflatable furniture in those days. Uh, on the commercial market, and you know, people were using inflatables in all kinds of ways uh, and plastic. Uh, these are some studio shots of Steve and Bob Rauschenberg in one of Steve's plastic tunnels. 
And this led up, uh, that was 1966, and this led up to the magnum opus of Steve's Inflatables, which was Physical Things, created in 1966 for that same nine evenings theater and engineering at the 26th Street Armory. This is the overall view, and inside the tunnels were performances and a corridor lined with projected slides of trees. Among the performers from other disciplines who participated in the workshop was visual artist Carolee Schneemann. Schneemann's art assemblages were strongly tactile, combining fur gleaned from the streets of her fur district loft, mirrors, and other found materials. Her first performances, performances were created within the Judson milieu and culminated in the famous orgiastic happening Meet Joy which was performed at Judson in November 1964. This piece is called Chromolodian Fourth Concretion in 1963 and was in the same spirit as her visual art and happenings, messy, energetic, and bursting with visual imagery rather than nuances of movement. The collage score was by Jim Tenney, a rack of clothing and rags formed the backdrop. Performers dressed and undressed, painted themselves, spoke. It exemplified the relationship of visual art to happenings, which Alan Capro regarded as action painting come to life. Like Meet Joy, it had detritus-like props, used food as a sensual metaphor, and exploited theatrical lighting. And this is Lucinda Childs in that piece with her body partially painted um, and I may be undergoing a costume change at that point. The other Judson dance figure associated with happenings is Al Hansen. Like Schneemann, Hansen was also a visual artist, but in that aspect, uh, his work was pure pop in his paintings. Um, Hansen's performance works fit into the public conception of happenings as total improvisation, whereas the most famous works that initiated the form by Alan Capro, Klaus Oldenburg, Jim Dine, Robert Whitman, and Red Grooms were based on structured scenarios. Par Parasol for Marisol, which is this picture, 1963, uh, was one of several somewhat different happenings that Al created using that name, probably because he liked the title which is written with the number four, Parasol for Marisol, and refers to the well-known pop artist, even though there's no Parasol or references to Marisol's work in the piece whatsoever. Al's happenings were fairly chaotic. He issued minimal instructions and encouraged people to do their thing. The performance area was always full of mundane and messy stuff one constant was rolls of toilet paper, uh, which you can see here. That's what's hanging there. Uh, always present, I think, in every piece I saw of his. In addition to visual artists, the workshop included many musician composers. Uh, the workshop had originally evolved out of the dance composition class taught by a composer, Robert Dunn at Merce Cunningham Studio. Part of that curriculum was to apply Cajun techniques of composition to movement. With this agenda, plus the group's openness to physically untrained performers and the overall tendency of the times to explore the interaction of various media, it was natural for mu musicians to participate. Philip Corner was one of the most active musical members. Here's his big trombone in 1963, in which he played the instrument for five or six minutes at full blast over taped collage of other sounds. Flares was performed by musicians and dancers. Uh, the musicians were Corner, Malcolm Goldstein, Max Newhouse, and Jim Tenney. The dancers, Beverly Schmidt, Arlene Rothline, and Vincent Wright. They had interchangeable roles. It, the dancers could make sounds as well as movements. The musicians could move as well as make music. All the actions were performed in flashes of light that were interspersed with silent blackouts, and that's why it was called flares. 
The entire concert of dance number 14 in April 1964 consisted of improvisations, uh, sometimes several by individual dancers going on simultaneously, uh, while Corner and Max Newhouse improvised musically, and this is Philip at the piano. And I don't know who the dancer is in the background. In the early 1960s, both at Judson and elsewhere, there was a surge of interest in layering art forms. Film, music, dance, theater, and visual art commingled in the new multimedia performances. Three of the innovators in this respect were Elaine Summers, Judith Dunn, and Beverly Schmidt, who is now known, known as Beverly Blossom. Schmidt, who had been a member of Alwa Nikolai's company, I'm sorry, I'm gonna go back to that often worked with her husband, the actor Roberts Blossom, in the multimedia technique he called film stage. Her piece, The Seasons, 1963, was one of the most effortlessly breathtaking uses of this form. She danced lyrically against a black and white film of herself performing the same dance. The film was by Mario Joran, a brilliant photographer whose work Peter admired very much. Joran's still photographs were by turns moody, romantic, and unflinching in the manner of Larry Clark and Nan Golden. At one point in this piece, the background suddenly changed to a slide of brilliant red flowers, and uh, Beverly was in a bright red mumu. Uh, she changed costumes several times for each of the seasonal sections. In other works, uh, Beverly used films combining both positive and negative images and other unexpected filmic uh, experiments and innovations. Elaine Summers' major multimedia piece was Fantastic Gardens, an elaborate evening length work that she created for a large cast in 1964. Uh, this is a dancer up in the balcony um, Behind, in other words, facing the other way, uh, dancers perform shadow-like in front of uh, a film. Uh, actually, it's one dancer performing shadow-like in front of a film of herself. And it was a very different effect from Schmidt's Blossoms. Um, Fantastic Gardens was a huge, vivid work that made use of the whole sanctuary and in various sections incorporated the collaboration of sculptors, musicians, and the audience. In one section, Summers satirized other choreographers, including some from the Judson Circle. This uh, would seem to be Martha Graham. She was adventurous in many ways. In Country Houses, uh, 1963, which was during one of the concerts at the Gramercy Arts Theater, that small theater with a proscenium stage I mentioned. Uh, she, she worked with ladders and explored all the possibilities for entrances and exits, including a trap door and the auditorium balcony. The sound by Robert Dunn was composed of lines from Oscar Wilde's plays, spoken live by the dancers. And this is a performance in her studio in 1966. Uh, that's painter Rosalind Drexler standing up there. Uh, the audience, of course, included always a lot of artists. Another dancer who worked with film was Judith Dunn. This is Last Point, 1964, a collaboration with filmmaker Gene Friedman and Judith's husband, the composer Robert Dunn, who had uh, started the, um, uh, the classes at the Cunningham Studio. Uh, like Summer's work, Judith Dunn's covered a wide spectrum. In Speed Limit from 1963, Robert Morris led Dunn in on a cart. There was a lot of physical gymnastic type activity. At one point, Morris vaulted up against a wall with a pole, a prop manipulation reminiscent of his own Arizona, the piece I showed before. The two dancers tied each other up and had to be wheeled out. 
1964 was filled with quotidian activities that were just slightly off kilter. Dunn ironed her dress while wearing it, which is, I believe, what she's doing in the background there. Deborah Hay approached Lucinda Childs and combed her hair in exceedingly slow motion. And Childs suddenly fell off her stool into Alex Hay's arms. Witness 2, a solo from Dunn's evening called Motorcycle, was performed simultaneously with Robert Dunn's sound work, Doubles for Four, in the background. The musicians shuffled cards that had instructions for hand clapping patterns, which counterpointed and overlapped each other. Do Horse, a collaborative improvisation with Bill Dixon's jazz group, was performed in Central Park as part of Charlotte Mormon's fourth annual avant-garde festival in 1966. Arlene Rothline was among the more dramatic choreographers and performers at Judson. This is her morning raga with yellow chair from 1963. Uh, there was a taped accompaniment of Indian ragas and all the movements took place on or while touching the chair. She was extremely intense and passionate as a dancer. Eileen Pasloff was another, is another charismatic and expressive performer. Here in April and December, choreographed by Remy Charlotte. This photo is from her own piece, Unholy Picnic, and that's her and uh, Elaine Summers is at the bottom. Another particularly striking use of objects appears in Eileen's bench desk dance, 1964, in which the performers, and this is Lucinda Childs, maneuvered benches accompanied appropriately, appropriately enough by Lamont Young's music for tables, chairs, and benches, a cacophonous screeching of furniture being dragged across a floor. And my memory of that, which I haven't checked on, is that in addition to the noise that they made in performing, that there was a tape of Lamont's rendition of that piece. Uh, I'm pretty sure there was. It's very loud <laughs> and screeching. This is Boa Constrictor by Eileen. Uh, from 1963, and she described it as ugly, comic, and melodramatic, a dance about the fact that I love eating. She was covered in feather boas, standing silently in one spot, and mimed gluttony with greatly exaggerated gestures. Freddie Herco, here shown in Jimmy Waring's Drumanon in 1964, was yet another fascinating stage. He died a few months after this picture was taken. Although he created several pieces on the early Judson programs, the most memorable one for me was performed elsewhere in early 1964 at the Cordier Ekstrom Gallery on Upper Madison Avenue during what was probably the first American exhibition of sound sculptures. Dervish was a tour de force in which, swathed in a fur coat, wearing an umbrella as a hat, Herco entered the gallery playing a flute. After removing the coat, he spun in a trance-like state, so steadily and for such a prolonged period that he practically dematerialized. His accompaniment was one of the sound sculptures in the exhibition, Joe Jones's mechanical drum set that hung from the gallery ceiling. Joe was good friends with Freddie and collaborated with him several times, even though they might seem to have been polar opposites aesthetically. Joe was associated with Fluxus, while much of Freddie's work was flamboyantly camp. Such crossover connections of individual performers, groups, media, and aesthetic inclinations are ripe for further examination, and I, show, I hope to show more of them in my other lectures. The so-called second generation of Judson dancers, among them Meredith Monk, Kenneth King, and Phoebe Neville, continued to expand 
on the compositional procedures and aesthetic directions pursued by the workshop members. We see in particular the incorporation of everyday movement and objects along with trends towards intermedia and multimedia. Meredith Monk's The Beach, revised in 1966, was based on poses of artists' models. Portable, 1966, her duet with Phoebe Neville, included this house-like structure. Peter covered Meredith's career for 25 years, from her beginnings as a dancer through her evolution into theater of images type large-scale productions with music and her transformation into primarily a composer-performer. Here's Kenneth King with Laura Dean in his blowout, 1966. Uh, Kenneth has always been interested in language as well as movement and has been a major uh, figure working uh, in areas that combine the two. One of the first pieces he did with an experimental text was print out in 1968, in which text was simultaneously on audio tape and projected on a wall. It also produced this haunting image of a hooded figure switching off the bare light bulb that had served as Kenneth's theatrical illumination. This piece was performed in the Judson Gallery, which was a smallish room downstairs. As I mentioned in my introduction, theater had been produced on a regular basis at Judson, even before dance, and the church's Poets Theater gave fairly regular productions all through the 1960s. One highlight of 1963 was a show, and I use the word show intentionally, called What Happened, that marked the beginning of a long collaboration between Assistant Minister Al Carmine's uh, and his music, Larry Kornfeld's direction, and Gertrude Stein's texts. And the most famous creation in that of these three uh, was In Circles, which was a few years later. What happened was in a, unabashedly what one would call a musical, with catchy melodies and lively ensembles, including a substantial contingent of dancers. Everyone sang, not just talked in the avant-garde way, but sang as they danced, starting off around the piano. Still singing and with owls still playing, they moved the piano across the space, and each had a start turn. This is Yvonne, Arlene Rothline, and in the background being carried aloft, Lucinda Childs. Joan Baker, vamping owls, she was even inside the piano in, at one point. Eileen Pasloff again. The mood was joyous and playful, although I understand that this was not so during rehearsals. It was quite a leap from the analytic cooper cooperative nature of the dance workshop to working with a theater director who had his own vision of a new form of musical theater. Uh, this is Lucinda being chased by Joan Baker. But the piece was so infectious and the audience reacted so happily during the first performance that it all came together and the performers were swept up in the enthusiasm. You can see how happy everyone looks at the curtain call. And it was revised several times over the next few years. Uh, this is a later performance in which Bert Supree on the left in the first row of men took over one of the parts. Another sparkling musical was created with some of the dancers a few years later. Uh, a Beautiful Day was the 1965 Christmas production at the church. It consisted of 12 short poem plays by the poet and children's book author Ruth Krauss, choreographed and directed by Remy Charlotte with music by Al Carmines. This is duet in which June Ekman and Gretchen McLean, uh, with June Ekman and Gretchen McLean, a very bouncy musical number in which they sang about their yellow umbrellas. Here's a, a section called A Show, a play, It's a Girl, with Bert Supree and Eileen Pasloff. As they danced, the sleeves of Shindy Tukayar's dress, which had been gathered at her shoulders, expanded down to the floor. 
One of the two or three dances that most represents the legacy of Judson in people's minds is Yvonne Rayner's, Rayner's Trio A from The Mind is a Muscle. Uh, this is a picture of uh, Yvonne in rehearsal in 1966. Uh, this is a special studio performance of the solo version in November 1965, two months before the first public one in early 1966. This is one example of where the volume and historical depth of Peter's archive presents a multi-layered conundrum for me, because in general, I focused on unknown and lesser-known artists, lesser-known works by better-known artists, and lesser-known images from all of these. So it's really the tip of the iceberg, and um, I'm not going to be showing a lot of Yvonne's, uh, uh, photographs of Yvonne's work, just as I didn't show a lot of Meredith's work, even though there's a huge amount there, because a, a lot of that work is better known. But in that vein of the lesser known pieces, uh, Trio A's four and a half minutes of evenly paced motion had by 1966 acquired uh, Trio B, a series of runs and athletic movements with the same steady, unaccented tempo. And that's uh, Becky Arnold, Barbara Dilley, and um, Peter Saul. And you see the Trio A performers from that performance from that particular performance, sitting it out in the background. At the height of Vietnam War, press, war protest in 1970, Judson ho hosted the People's Flag Show in which this whole room was covered with artworks based on the flag in reaction to the censorship and arrest of um, uh, uh, Mark Morell's uh, uh, piece, I think, particularly uh, um, in, uh, started this when, when uh, Steve, the gallery, uh, um, uh, Stephen Rodich's gallery, uh, showed Mark Morell's work and it was uh, closed by the police. Um, at the opening, the Grand Union performed Trio A clothed only in American flags. Thus did this moment. Thus did this most uninflected of dances acquire a somewhat more potent history. Over the last 40 years, the arts program at Judson has waxed and waned and waxed again. Since the 1990s, we have come full circle with movement research's exhilarating use of this space, still a sanctuary. Thank you. <laughs>